Thank you so much, Celebration. It's always a joy to be here, and I love it when y'all are doing the music. We could just have them come up there and sing another couple songs, and we could just go home. We could be, that'd be done, right? So welcome again, everyone. Uh, for those of you all who haven't met, I am Rick Busby. I'm a licensed Unity teacher uh, here affiliated with Unity Church of the Hills. I'm in my 21st year uh, as a member here at Unity Church of the Hills. Uh, uh, my first service here was uh, the second week they were open here in the sanctuary, which was about a month after the 911 uh, events. And... Um, I'd been attending just down the street here when they were still in the strip center with a songwriting group. And then when the, they made the transfer here, I decided one morning, well, I'll uh, just go check out the new church because the songwriting group will start meeting there. So I'll just go check out the new church. And I left the house. And I wasn't looking for a spiritual home, by the way. I was just coming to check out the new facility. And I was standing out right outside the office out there in the, in the foyer. And... Uh, watching people go about the business of getting ready for the service. And I was just standing there. I didn't, I knew two people at that point in time, and neither one of them were there. Uh, so I was just kind of standing there, and, and I just had this voice just kind of drop in and just say, you're home. And I was like, I, I am. <laughs> and like I said, I didn't realize that I was uh, looking for a spiritual home, but I guess I was, and I said yes. And and, uh, and then the rest has just unfolded. Over. It's, it's breathtaking to me to think that it's been 21 years. Um, today's talk, uh, uh, Reverend Sheree asked me to substitute for her, and she'd already had the, the talk planned, the talk title and the talk topic planned out today, so I just kind of inherited uh, that. But it's a good one. It's a good one. It's always a timely one. And, and as you all know, uh, Reverend Sheree has been kind of asking a series of questions in her talks here recently, trying to get us to respond and, and come into that and ask those questions in consciousness that keeps us moving towards our transformation. And the question today is, is being loved by God enough? Is being loved by God enough? Now, it might shock you to hear my answer to that. And the short answer, the, the high concept answer is no, it's not enough. What, Rick? <laughs> what are you talking about? God's love is infinite. God's love is eternal. God's love is unlimited. God's love is unconditional. What do you mean that's not enough? Has anybody ever been in a relationship where you were either the one loving or the one being loved, but it wasn't reciprocal? How'd that go for you? Right? Right? was a challenge, wasn't it? It's the same thing in our relationship with God. God's love is enough to activate our life, to give us life. God's love is enough to create nature and to keep all of this kind of moving forward and everything. But we have a special relationship with God, right? We've been given free will, something even the angels weren't given, right? And so because of that free will, it wouldn't be enough for God just to love us and not give us free will, and then we just have to be in allegiance to God. God wants us to freely choose that relationship. So when we ask that question, is being loved by God enough, you have to unpack that. Enough for what, number one? That's the first kind of rabbit trail we got to go down. Enough for what? Is God's love enough to maintain my peace? Right? Is God's love enough to ensure financial success or creative success or professional success? Is God's love enough to ensure success in relationships? Not without me doing some work first, that I have to engage that. I often say, you know, change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. We see change all around us all the time, right? It's inevitable. We're not in control of that. But transformation is optional because it requires my engagement. It requires my willingness to allow the changes that I'm experiencing in the world going on around me. I have to engage with that and allow those changes to be the motivation for my own personal transformation. So God's love, while it's there, while it's ever-present, that's what we affirm here in unity, right? God's love is ever-present. 
wherever I am, God is, right? But if I'm not aware of that, if I haven't accepted that into my own heart and into my own consciousness, then God's present, God's presence, I should say, is kind of meaningless around me if I don't see it. If you don't see, you don't see, right? The power of our faith, Charles Fillmore calls the power of our faith, our perceiving power, right? It's the power that allows us to perceive possibilities before they come into form. And it's the same way with our faith in God, that that power of our faith allows us to perceive that potential for the divine, that it is present. Now, you and I know that we are created in the image and likeness of God, right? That's one of unity's principles. Now, there's only one power, one presence active in the universe and in our lives, God the good. We say that God is omnipotent, right? God is omniscient, right? God is omnipresent. That's if we're personifying God. If we get to just the principle of God, then God is omnipresence itself. God is omnipotence itself. God is power, not is all powerful. God is power. And that power ultimately is love. We, are, we attribute all kinds of characteristics to God. One of them is God is love, right? Y'all heard that, right? God is love. Once or twice, that's exactly right. You'll hear it maybe two or three more times today. So just add, calculate that up there. So, so God is love. If I'm created in the image and likeness of God and God is love, then I'm created as love, to be love. That is my true nature. That is my foundational spiritual identity, love. But it doesn't automatically express, even though it's in my spiritual DNA. I have a choice. And as in, in the language of A Course in Miracles, of course, it, it talks about us choosing between what? Love and fear. Love and fear. That's the choice that we're making all day, every day. And sometimes, many times, maybe even most times, if we're practiced at it, we're choosing love. But we don't choose love perfectly because there are still things that can tap into our fear, can tap into our humanness, our limited self, the self that we perceive as being limited. And before we know it, we've chosen fear. Right? When we choose fear, we wind up in separation, feelings of guilt, anger, shame, all of those things that Dr. David Hawkins in his work would keep in the lower end of his map of consciousness, what he would call force, as opposed to power. Power is derived from love. So if God is love, and I'm creating the image and likeness of God, then I am love, but I have free will. So I have to engage, I have to I have to. Uh, the amount of love that I can give, the amount of love that I can express in the world is directly relative to the amount of love that I allow myself to receive from God. Right? I have to allow myself to receive it, and then as I receive it, it becomes incumbent upon me then to do what? To express that love, to give it away. And when you're giving away something that's unlimited in potential, it's amazing. There's always more love to give, right? We don't exhaust ourselves. We think that in, in, our, in our romantic relationships, sometimes we, in our special relationships, what the Course in Miracles calls our special relationships, there's a belief, and a mistaken belief, that love is limited, right? That there's only so much love to go around, and so I must dole it out in, in sort of quantities. And our special relationships, we reserve for more love, and then as it goes down the pecking order, there's friends, and then there's acquaintances, and then there's just people in the general world and everything, and we think that if we give all of our love to one person or a small group of people, that we don't have enough love to give to everybody. It's exhausting, right? But the truth is, you are love, period. That's your authentic nature. That's your divine spiritual identity. And if we align ourselves with that, if we genuinely uh, engage that and authentically express that, then we're just being who we're born to be, right? We're being authentic to our nature. That's not exhausting. That's empowering. The more love I give, the more love I have to give. Spirit loves a willing vessel, right? 
Willingness is a big old deal. Once again, name checking, of course, in miracles. There's that idea of the little willingness, right? Talks in, in context of forgiveness, for example. Ah, this thing that happened to me, it's really, really bad. And this person that did this to me is really, really bad. I don't know if I can forgive them. And even if I did know if I could forgive them, I don't know how that would work. Of course, miracle sets us free from that dilemma because it says to us that we don't have to know how forgiveness does its work. You don't have to know. You don't have to figure it out in your intellectual capacity. What you do have to do is to be willing to forgive. That's all. Just be willing to forgive. Because if you're not willing to forgive, guess what you are willing to do? You're willing to hold on to the grievance instead. One way or the other, your will is engaged. So all I have to do is convert that willingness to hold on to the grievance, that willingness to have my peace continuously disturbed by this unforgiveness. And I transfer that willingness to say, you know what? I want a different result. I want a different experience. I want a different experience. I want to know peace. I want to let this go. I want to release this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to get all this stuff corrected. I don't know how I'm going to make amends for what is mine to make amends for. But I'm willing. I'm willing to be shown. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to have a new experience. And in that willingness, that's when the power comes in. That's when the power of love has an opening. But it requires my exercise of that personal will to create the opening. Love doesn't force itself on us, does it? Right? I'm going to read this. I want to encourage you, maybe if you're comfortable, to close your eyes and just take this in. This is a pretty famous scriptural passage. You'll probably remember it. But I, want, I invite you to close your eyes and just listen to these characteristics of love and, and feel them. And as you're hearing this, just kind of think in terms of how you're doing at these, at these aspects. So this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. It's a much longer section, but I'm just going to read this one. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Do we do that perfectly? Anybody? Anybody do that perfectly? Because if you do, I want you to come up here, and I want to sit down here, and you can, like, <laughs> tell us how that works, Right? That's a pretty ambitious list, and we all fall short of the glory, as they say. Nobody does this perfectly. Once again, getting back to A Course in Miracles, the secret, the strategy when I have my peace is disturbed is because I've chosen fear in some form or capacity. I've chosen wrongly, right, and I want to reestablish my peace. I want to have a different experience. And for those of y'all that have done the Course of Miracles, and for those of y'all that haven't, somewhere around, right at about 670 pages of text, right? The text, not the lessons, just the text. 670 pages. And at the end of it all, it distills down to two words. Choose again. If I am not at peace, if I am not feeling love, I have chosen wrongly. Period. That's just, that's that simple. I have chosen wrongly because love is the only reality. God's love is enough if I'm willing to allow it, to receive it, right? So if I'm not feeling it, if I'm not seeing it, if I'm in my sense of separation, if I'm in my sense of judgment, right, then I'm choosing from my fear. And if I'm choosing from my fear, the easy way to know if you're choosing from your fear is just check in with how your peace is doing. And really, that's just, that's just a simple litmus test. Am I feeling peace in this moment? If you're not, then chances are you've chosen wrongly. 
And if you've chosen wrongly, you've chosen fear and not love. God's love is big enough for us and unconditional enough for us that he allows us to choose wrongly from time to time. So that when we know the difference between choosing wrongly and choosing rightly, we give it of our own free will. If God just insisted upon this and gave us no free will, then it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be any fun. I mean, really, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be any fun. We wouldn't have near the range of experience that we're allowed in this world. The real question is, can you become grateful in your own heart, in your own life? Can you become grateful for your entire life, the good and the bad, the rich and the poor? Like, can you, can you be grateful for it all? And if you can wrap your heart and your mind around all of it, then you got a shot. Then you got a shot. Because we have to claim it. We can't separate ourselves from it. Our experience is our experience. Wherever God is, you know, wherever I am, excuse me, God is, right? So whatever I've experienced travels with me as well. I can neutralize it through forgiveness. I can neutralize that. I can let it go. I can release that. I can reestablish my peace. But I have to choose it. God's love is not enough to ensure that I will choose it. And God will not stop me from choosing otherwise. That brings the onus of personal responsibility back to me. That I am responsible for the quality of of my consciousness, I'm responsible for the quality of my experience. If I'm love, if I'm created as love, if I'm created in the image and likeness of God and God is love and I'm created in the image and likeness of God, then I am love too. That's my authentic nature. But that authentic nature, as I said, does not express automatically. It requires my engagement. It requires my expression. It requires my willingness it's true for me, it's true for you, it's true for all of us. And everybody is experiencing some challenge in their life. Everybody's going through something. It's not just me that's going through some stuff. Everybody's going through some stuff. And if I'm willing to look through the eyes of love and with a heart of love at that, then, I, then compassion becomes easy. Empathy becomes natural. It's what we give because we give as love that we are. The uh, saw this nice little definition today for, y'all have heard of agape love, right? That's one of the forms of love. Agape love is sort of the highest expression of love. Nice little definition that the Greek term agape is applied both to the love that human beings have for God and to the love that God has for humans. It's a reciprocal dynamic. Right? We give as we receive. You've heard that before? Right? We give and receive. So if I can only give a little bit of love in the world, if I can only allow just a little bit of love to express to me, it's better than not allowing any love to express to me. But if I'm only allowing a little bit, then I'm not getting the full range of the experience. I'm not experiencing the full range of God's grace. I'm not experiencing the full range of God's power. So getting back to our question, is being loved by God enough? Enough for what, right? That, that's the first, first rabbit trail, enough for what? It's unlimited. Well, if it's unlimited, it better be enough because if, <laughs> if it's not enough, we got a real challenge. What are we going to replace that with? Fortunately, God is love. And if we get past, if we can get past in our own consciousness, get past this idea of God as a personified being who is somehow remote from us. We say God is everywhere present, of course. It wouldn't be really remote. It'd be right here with us right now, right? But still, if God is personified, it's a separate individual. If we can get beyond the idea of personification and just get to God as divine principle, as creative principle, as the principle of love, then it becomes much easier to, to see that love is everywhere. Love is the only reality. The other stuff we're making up. We're trying to impose that on the reality that is love. And when we do that, y'all have heard that thing? It's that when you find yourself 
digging yourself into a hole, that the first thing to do is to put down the shovel and step away from the shovel. Like, you got to stop. That if you're not feeling love, if you're not feeling peace, then simply stop doing what you're doing. Step away. Choose again. And the good news about God's love is that it's unconditional, right? And we remember that, what it said a minute ago in the, in the, in the statement that I read. This is a good one. Uh, it does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. How are we doing with that? All right, how are we doing with that? So I'm going to close with this, this little thing just, just to tell you. This is a little, just a little silver cross, right? And in, imprinted on there, it says, God loves you, right? I've had this little cross now for about 28 years. It was given to me by a friend of mine who's now, we just passed our, basically our 40-year anniversary of knowing each other. He's a songwriting friend of mine, one of my real good friends. Our kids were born together and grew up, all that kind of stuff. He gave this to me when I was in probably the, the ultimate dark night of the soul experience I was having. This is the one that kind of leveraged me onto a spiritual path. Has anybody ever had a dark night of the soul? Anybody ever had more than one? Yeah. But this was, this was the dark night of the soul, capital T-H-E, the dark night of the soul. And he gave this to me. And at the time he gave this to me, it said, God loves you. I cried because I didn't know what I believed about God, much less believing that God loved me because I was a mess at that point in time. My life was a mess. I had made a mess of things. I had spent 36 years of my life and felt like I had been going down the entire wrong track the, the entire time. And I didn't know what, what the future held, so to speak. But this little thing. This, this, this little cross right here probably cost five bucks, if that. Right? God loves you. I still have it. Do you know how many times I have lost this and it showed back up? One time I lost it for about a year. I thought it was gone for sure because I would carry it around my pocket. There's, it could have lost it in any number of places. One day I'm getting into my car and uh, I had a, uh, my keys in my hand. I got in uh, and I fumbled my keys and they went in between the seat and the console. So I had to get out of the car, get in the back seat, and get up underneath there to fish the keys out. And guess what was laying there? It had been with me the entire time that I had thought it was lost. So God's love is ever-present. Even when you think it's not, it's present. So what I want to invite you all to do today, we'll go into meditation here in just a little bit and take this a little deeper after celebration sings us a beautiful, another beautiful song. But what I want to encourage you to do is be thinking about that. Is being loved by God enough? And how much are you allowing that in your own experience? How much of God's love are you allowing yourself to receive? How much of God's love are you allowing to be expressed through you? Because if God is love and you are created in the image and likeness of God, then you are loved too. You are loved too. Now it becomes incumbent upon us to align ourselves with that reality, to align ourselves with that spiritual identity, and express ourselves accordingly. So earlier on I said, is being loved by God enough? And I said the short answer is no. Now I'm going to change position and say the short answer is maybe, depending upon me depending upon how I engage, depending upon my willingness to receive that love. That's the challenge, is allowing myself to receive that love. And then when I receive that love and I feel the miracle of that love, then it becomes as natural as the day to give it away. So I want to encourage you all to think about that in your own life. And by the end of this day, before the sun sets, I encourage each one of you to set that intention for yourself to receive, to allow yourself to receive a little bit more of God's love, just to create that little opening, that place of resistance that you might be in. Because God's love is enough if we're willing.